thought I'd just talk um, very, very quickly about what zero, I think, means from a sort of business studies uh, perspective. And then I always find that the question sessions are much more fun than any sort of speeches, so we'll get straight into those. Um, but I think what's interesting uh, with zero is we're now seeing um, some more sophisticated uh, funding models in, um, in business that we haven't seen in New Zealand before. So, you know, most, uh, most businesses in New Zealand, when they start, um, th there really is no capital. So we tend to do service type businesses. They don't, they don't require a huge amount of money up front. So in my own background, uh, when I peeled out of um, Ernst & Young, we went and started a software consulting business. You know, um, but, you know, basically it was selling time. And the money that we required to get started was you know, just being able to buy a few PCs that we could actually lease and, um, and really just not getting paid until that first check came through. And as I think some of the students would have found going through this um, uh, exercise over the last year, when you don't have capital, the, the, the size of your ideas can, can really only be quite small. And then, and then, um, then, what, we, then what we found was uh, the next level of software is, is building something once that you can ship around the world. So um, uh, the, the kind of next big business I did was a company called Aftermail, which was an email archiving solution that we sold uh, the US businesses, or we, uh, we sold to companies all over the world. And the neat thing about that is you could use your, use your brains to write um, intellectual property, and then the game was to take a really good product and try to sell it as many times as you could. And what we realized was um, there was a pattern in business where, um, uh, where US public companies had to buy uh, technology companies. Because um, you know, uh, being a public company, you always need to grow revenue, and um, you're always looking uh, uh, for new products that you can put on the shelves. And there's an arbitrage that they get if they can buy sort of um, private companies at a revenue multiple of three or four, and they get valued on their revenue multiple of eight or nine. You're going to buy a private company revenue all day because it will grow the company. So we realized that um, if we could build up a cool bit of technology, we'd have a great chance of selling that business to a US public company. So with Aftermail, we executed that pattern of not trying to build a long-term sustainable business, but actually build a business that an American company uh, would buy. And that, and, and that was good. We actually sold that business within two years of starting for um, 15 million US in cash and uh, 20 million of potential earn out, which we got none of, which was quite interesting. But that capital that we did then allowed us to do the next thing, uh, which was to, um, uh, to do something much, much bigger. And, and with Zero, we saw that it was a massive opportunity around the world. Uh, when I sold um, Aftermail, we had, uh, I think, about 23, 25 staff. And doing Zero properly, building a, you know, a, um, an accounting engine that ultimately almost all businesses around the world could use, uh, being able to have support, uh, being able to sell it online, being able to have you know, marketing and sales people, all of those things, we figured that the minimum size of that company, even at starting, was about 50 people. 50 people is about $500,000 a month, and we're only getting a small amount of monthly fees, and at the beginning, the product's not very good because we haven't done much. So we needed, we, we figured, um, about $15 million worth of capital to have the opportunity um, to build that business up. And uh, back at that time, you couldn't raise $15 million in the New Zealand venture capital market. Probably the biggest deal was three or four million. We probably could have raised 15 million if we went up to the US, uh, but then the business would have been worth 20 and we would have, would have been sold by now because that's how VCs make money. So we were able to uh, follow Jeff Ross after 42 Below, tell a big story, and, uh, and we raised $15 million. Um, and this was going back seven or eight years ago. And that capital then allowed us to put those 50 people in place and then, and then have the time to build the business. So since then, what's been really amazing is we've raised now over 325 million, I think. We've invested over 200 million in building our platform. We've now created over 600 new jobs. We've got 14 offices, just opened up Denver and got a big office in San Francisco. The office in San Francisco, uh, the monthly rental is about the same as the annual rental at our beautiful Wellington office. So when I was signing that lease, I was throwing up in the corner. Um, and, um, and you know, we've got now over, I think, over 225,000 customers with the latest public number we put out. And, uh, you know, people are investing in our business. We just raised another uh, 150 million US because people can see that we have the potential to be a 20, 50, 100 billion dollar company. You know, the Facebook-sized company in our space. And there's no one else who's really been funded. 
So what Xero gives us now from a resource point of view is the opportunity for you guys to, um, to really explain different types of business models and because we've been public and we've been blogging from day one, you have a fantastic amount of resources. So I would urge you to go and have a look at the investor page on Xero. Our entire corporate history is there. So you can get your students to come in and you'll, they'll hear the story. There's plenty of videos on our blog, you know, zero.com slash blog, and they can go and search through there and, and they'll find um, a, a really good story. So um, I think for them to understand now at the extreme, if you can raise capital to do really big things, that's an amazing, that's an amazing lesson. And putting that in context with, you know, most small businesses are actually funded off, the, off people's mortgages in New Zealand. Um, and, then, and then we've got a full portfolio. So I would just say that there's fantastic resources. We've documented the journey really well. So um, you know, you'd be able to ask some questions and get your students to sort of dig deep and to understand these different types of business models. So that's really all I wanted to say, and I'd love any sort of questions, and we'll dive into what's important for you guys. Anyone? Yeah, I'll just screen, just screen the question out and I can um, reply it back. So the question is, how did you guys raise $15 million at the very beginning? And at that time, um, we had um, almost no revenue. We had less than 100 customers, and most of them would have um, uh, been blood relatives. Uh, and, um, and we were going to do um, an IPO. So there's a, there's a few things, and, and, a, and a lot of business is about timing. So Jeff Ross had just done 42 Below. So 42 Below was the vodka brand. And he was really the first one on the New Zealand Stock Exchange to say, look, we don't really have a product. What we have is a great idea and some great people. If you give us 15, I think they were about the same sort of numbers, about $15 million, uh, we'll be able to um, take that and do something really good with it. So do you bet that we could do that? Most people would say no. Enough people said yes. And they sold that business to uh, Bacardi with, with, within about two or three years. So uh, people who went in and put money into 42 Below actually did quite well. So, um, so we were able to leverage what Jeff Ross had done, uh, but do it slightly differently. When we did zero, this was off the back of we just sold um, Aftermail, and some of the numbers were always wrong. Some were kind of saying for 65 million, it was 15 million US in cash and 20 million of potential earn out. So it was about 35 million, maybe it converted to 50 or 60 Kiwi. So, but that was done within two years. So that looked really good. I was on the board of Trade Me. Um, I was an independent director, so the closest guy was deal that got no cash. But people had suddenly seen Trade Me go from, you know, what's that worth? No one had any idea to be worth you know, $750 million. So right at that time, there was a lot of hype and tech. And what I made sure was that um, when these deals were done, that people could see that I was involved with them because I knew that I wanted to do something big later. So when we did zero, we, um, uh, you know, we were off right at the back of these really good things. We were doing great tech out of New Zealand. And we put a really good board, you know, Sam Morgan was on the board, so we created some perception there. We did a huge amount of market research. Uh, Chris Liddell was the CFO of Microsoft, managed to get him to put something into our prospectus. Um, we, we worked with really uh, reputable bankers, First New Zealand Capital and Cameron Partners. So we did a whole lot of sort of assembly so it looked kind of reasonable, but the stu and what we also realised is that um, when you think about um, investing, you want a, a spread portfolio of risk, and risk is good because um, if you have all safe investments, you don't do really well. In a portfolio, you want to have some risky stuff, and a lot of the New Zealand um, uh, stocks at the time are kind of boring, dividend-paying, um, kind of boring infrastructure-type stocks. So we, we thought, well, you know, in a balanced portfolio, you should have 3% of your portfolio should be in things that are really risky. So what's more risky than something with no revenue? But it kind of looks kind of interesting. So in a portfolio approach, if there's billions of dollars spent, there should be an amount that gets put into risk. And we didn't have to convince everybody, we just had to convince enough. And um, uh, so for all of those reasons, we managed to get that 15 million away. And then since then, that 15 million was the start of the journey. As I said, we've raised over 300. Uh, invested over 200, which is the money we've spent plus the revenue that we've made. So we have over 200 million cash in the bank, which is amazing for a software company. Imagine if you had said that a few years ago, Andrew, you'd have a New Zealand software company with 200 million bucks in the bank. And, um, and, and you know, we're worth, um, you know, three to four billion dollars. So, and that's actually a pretty reasonable valuation when you benchmark us against other SaaS companies in the world. So, you know, it's timing and um, I don't think you have the right to do that on your first gig. 
And, and if you think about entrepreneurship as a series of baby steps, I've done a service business, I've done a trade sale, and that builds reputation, builds network, builds some of your own capital. So the first million into zero, and the bulk of the money that went before IPO was mine. So you know, you're know you able to kind of, you know, when, you have a, when you've done a trade sale, you can afford to do something big. Questions? Can talk to, tell us a little bit about the product itself, of zero sales, and how you got about to do that in starting up. <laughs> Yeah, so, the, so what's, the, what's the product of Xero? So Xero is online accounting for small business. That sounds really boring, but I tell you, it's sexy. So, um, so the reason for that is um, the biggest market in the world is all, um, is, is all consumers, right? That's the, probably the biggest market. But consumers don't like spending money on stuff. But with your consumer hat on, you've seen some pretty cool internet innovations. What sort of... What sort of things have you guys been doing on with your consumer hats on as, as individual people on the internet that you didn't do five years ago? Buying apps. Yep, yeah, buying apps. Yep. They do spend a little bit of money on that, but um, but the well, you know what are the big consumer websites? Uh, I like who's on Facebook. That's interesting. You all look married, huh? <laughs> um, you know, but you know, Facebook, trade, and all those sort of things. But the business model normally, is, you know, Google is all in. Uh, and YouTube is about buying ads. So the smartest people in technology have been trying to, have been working on trying to sell you stuff that you don't need. Um, we figured the next biggest market was all small businesses. And uh, small businesses are also consumers, but with your small business hat on, you'll pay for stuff. Because, you know, money coming in, money going out. And, you, and so we thought that small business was actually probably one of the biggest monetizable opportunities that were on the web. And then what we realized was accounting software is kind of a killer app. So everybody has bank accounts, the smart people have business advisors, and they all have a relationship with the tax man. So you can choose to use accounting software or not, but you must do the accounting function. And um, what we also realized was um, accounting is one of the few business apps that has a natural channel. So with most um, sort of businesses, you have to try to sell it on, you know, to each business. With um, accounting software, there's a channel of accounting, and each accountant has three to 500 customers. So that actually gives you a, a, an opportunity to build a sales force that can cost effectively work with accountants because if you get them on board, you get lots of customers. So we figured that accounting really was that beachhead application for small businesses. And also what's interesting is it's kind of once in a lifetime land grab. So individual data sitting on PCs isn't that interesting, but if you get it into one centrally managed store, it's really interesting. So as an example, we've processed now over $300 billion through our engine. New Zealand GDP is about 180 billion. We saw 35 billion of it last, um, last financial year. So we have this real-time graph of data that's going on that no one's ever seen before. And now we have more customers than all but the biggest banks because ANZ and National have merged, but next year we'll pass them. So we're able to use that, um, that mass of customers to actually get stuff done. So we've been advocating for things like single business number so that there's an electronic connection between all businesses. Uh, we've um, been working with the IRD on their transformation project saying, why would you guys spend 1.5 billion, which should be able to launch the New Zealand space program, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't, why would you hire tax developers in the same city that we are? What, all our customers are going to get tax returns in zero anyway. Why don't you guys just provide wholesale services and we'll uh, even provide a free public GST and POE returns because that's easy for us and you know, save a couple hundred million dollars out of that project. We're defining next generation banking web services so that uh, small businesses' uh, accounting software is directly linked to their bank. So what's really exciting is with the size that we are, we're the market maker for a whole lot of new services and we can just get stuff done. So accounting software um, sounds kind of boring but it's actually massively interesting because of the value of the data and, the, um, and, and, and what you can do with all of those customers. Yeah, so that's a great question. So, you know, how important is coding? Well, I don't think coding is necessarily important, but, but structured, um, the structured thinking um, around design of databases and business processes, I think is incredibly important. So there's an art called information engineering, which allows you to do things like, um, like data flow diagrams and entity relationship modeling. I think that the ability to have um, an engineer, which isn't, it's not that hard, but it's probably a good year or two of study at university, being able to express systems and processes in diagrammatic form uh, is an incredibly horizontal skill that I use every day. Um, and I think um, you know, my advice to people is do a little bit of technology, especially around database design, because you know, that's the modeling of how things interact with each other, and it allows you to really understand systems. 
and everything you do is about systems and being able to communicate those things and then do something you're really passionate about. And and because I, I you know I think everyone should do a little bit of that kind of systems, you know, information to systems design, that sort of stuff is a completely horizontal skill which allows you to communicate and have really good business discussions or discussions about anything, about how you organise things. Uh, so I think that's important. Um, one of the super interesting things that we're going through at the moment in Hawke's Bay is um, you know, this bring your own devices uh, thing and iPads and schools and all of that. And um, you know, I think that's just super interesting. And, and my, um, just sort of pending a question, my view on that is it's definitely balanced. Um, and what we've encouraged the schools to do is to go out and survey their parents to see because you know, many kids do already have access. Um, you know, we personally sponsored quite a few iPads into schools and um, I think people like doing that. So creating an environment where um, uh, you know, those schools should just say, look, we think that 60% of, um, of our kids already have access to devices, 40% don't. Uh, the cost of that is X, get that out there so that um, some parents or people in the community can uh, donate. It's a very, I think people like education, so create the opportunity for people to, um, uh, to get those devices in the school so that no kid uh, gets left behind. And ask the question, um, uh, back, back to the parents, uh, is technology a problem in your life? And everyone will say, those frickin' iPads, um, you know, which is such a great um, babysitting device so you can have a bit of a sleep in, but you naturally think they're a little bit bad as well. So getting um, that right balance of respect for technology and then not using technology, I think is a really interesting um, tension that's running at the moment, uh, which you guys as understanding probably a bit more about technology maybe than others uh, can, uh, can really help with. But it's amazing seeing now how, um, you know, our own, first of all from my two year old who's now five, when the iPads first arrived, wrestling the, I, my iPad off her to get out of the house in the morning. Uh, through to, they just go and find information on their own. So, you know, so my view is should iPads be in schools? Absolutely. But I think getting the um, respect of, you know, first of all, looking after something, making sure it's charged, um, you know, and getting that balance right of when you do use them and don't use them is incredibly valuable. But if you go to the US, you know, Khan Academy, all that sort of stuff, uh, kids are just running on their own with technology. It's pretty cool. Do you have any concerns about copycat competitors, particularly internationally? Uh, yeah, so copycat competitors, not really. I think if you go fast, far, going fast is the best defence. So doing things around patents and IP seems like a, a pretty negative strategy. So we do have a lot of people copying us and um, we just think go faster. What we do like though is we, um, is quite often when more people do it, it actually accelerates the whole industry. So, you know, and a lot of people sort of say, oh, you know, I want to tell you my idea as if someone's going to rip their idea off. The ideas are the easy part, the execution and, and actually getting things out there and selling stuff is the hard part. So uh, ideas are free, I think. It's actually just going fast and executing is much more important. Uh, to reach your goal of a million customers, uh, what percentage of the US market do you think you'll need? About 0.01 or something. Tiny. And is that about the same as the UK market? Yeah, I mean the UK market's five times the Australian market, so it's 10 or 15 times ours, so um, to get to a million customers is tiny. Yeah, so we're already um, you know, getting close to a quarter of a million already. We put that goal out there, it was when we had 50,000 customers, so we're 5x from there, almost, and um, we don't even say million anymore, it's too low, we have now softened the language to millions. <laughs> yeah, and the reason we did that was just people say, well how do we value you? Um, we say, well throw a million dollars at the top, throw, do you think we can get to a million? Oh yeah, we'll put that at the top of your spreadsheet and then the values drop out and then we look quite reasonable. So once you get a million, then they just tell two friends and we have three million. So, yeah. <laughs> That's marketing. Uh, uh, one of the questions that uh, we, one, uh, dealing with the Young Enterprise Trust using the Young Enterprise Scheme and BD Business Challenge, um, a lot of the, the product ideas we get are physical products, um, but a lot of the stuff you see in um, the, the public space at the moment is software products. So has that age for physical products kind of passed as a, um, as a good business plan? Yes, that's a great question. I think that goes back to the very first thing around if you don't have a lot of capital, you're kind of forced to do those sort of things. So whether it be making cookies or t-shirts. I did like the chalk t-shirt idea though. That was kind of cool, I'd buy that. Um, 
but that's the thing. So, so the challenge is how do you, um, so, 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 so maybe one of the threads should be not doing the final product, but actually doing the business plan and a marketing plan. So then you're not constrained by capital and get people thinking about the competitive um, analysis, presenting their idea. And if we did have money, this is what we would do. This is how we would market it. So maybe one of the ways that you deal with that is to think about a business plan and a marketing plan and maybe even like an offer, you know, what does the operational oil chart look like? Get them thinking about those sort of ideas as well, uh, which, which may be more productive for some of them than making another t-shirt or uh, some cookie mix. So I think it's good getting those base experiences, but the world has got a bit more sophisticated. So um, that might be a, be a way, it's an idea. So the sky is the limit because we've got 200 million of cash. So, um, yeah. So the question is, what's the future zero? So we want to be the um, we want to be a globally admired brand that um, uh, that makes business fun and and more profitable for people all over the world. So our when we talk to our staff, we want better schools and hospitals in New Zealand. How do we do that? Well, small business is the biggest contributor to GDP. You know, 38 percent in New Zealand. If we could make Small businesses, you know, five percent more productive. That's two and a half billion dollars or something. That is better schools and hospitals. So the way, so how do we do that? We provide great software. But what we actually realise that the accounting software is a communications tool. Getting accountants, real people working alongside real businesses, and coaching them is actually what makes the boat go faster. Because if you have an accountant working with a small business, you, you, the less likely to stuff up. You're going to be more with their existing cash flow. The more likely to get a business loan more likely to hire a new employee, more likely to expand, more likely to export. So, um, so that's how we think we make the boat go faster. Um, and um, we think we can do that at scale for the world. In fact, we think we're very well positioned to be the leader in the world. So our view is we will be a $100 billion Facebook type company, create you know, literally tens of thousands of jobs. In fact, we've probably even created 10,000 jobs already around the ecosystem. We have 300 add-on providers that link into us. And we've made um, business much more fun, and, um, and and there's a real passion around what we're doing. So you know, we just want to keep doing it. And one of the um, things that people said, because we, you know, I'd sold a couple of businesses before, is that people assumed that we were building up zero to sell. And one of the uh, fascinating things with um, being involved closely with Trade Me was we saw a bunch of young guys that smashed their financial goals out really, really early, and then you know they all kind of you know they bought nice cars and nice houses. But then they found that it wasn't really that many people to play with. And actually, you get a lot of purpose out of working. So I have no desire to retire. Working is really fun. Having 200 million in the bank to play more chess pieces is hugely fun. So, um, and if you can build a sustainable uh, work life where you're doing something that's really stimulating, you'll do it forever. And, um, you know, but you know, we try to go for a week in Hawaii every year, and, you know, we, do, we have good times. And, and all of that, but actually working is, is an incredibly enjoyable thing. So if you can, and you saw it last night, that's what's great about, um, um, uh, uh, um, about this program, is that uh, you just watch the kids actually realize that business can be sport and, and something you can be very passionate about. It's not, you know, it's never felt like work for me. To help, um, to help uh, us position our, our students in terms of exciting trends that you see in the market. Where do you think some of the new trends that we can possibly help navigate our students in terms of new market opening up away from, say, the cookies and the t-shirts that may help us position our students in that, in that space? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, it's really hard to pick um, you know, exactly where things will go, but you can see the big trends. So what are the trends that are really relevant or different to New Zealand than when we grew up? So as I said in my little thing last night, um, you know, when I started work 30 years ago, there was no internet, there was no email, certainly no Facebook. And um, uh, you know, you, 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 to, f to talk to somebody, you know, you're rotary dialing and talk to a switchboard and they'd pass you across. Um, and we were the country that's furthest away from anywhere else. So you naturally assume you do things small from New Zealand and then there's a whole lot of action going on somewhere else. And I sort of, sort of say this jokingly, you guys might, might, have, might get this. When I was uh, just a, just a young, young guy growing up in Napier, I remember going to the movies and seeing Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Does everyone sort of remember that? 
and you're convinced that all American kids are having sex, and I certainly wasn't. In fact, even when I went to America, I don't think I was either. But, but, but uh, you know, you kind of had this chip on your shoulder that we're from this little country, and that, and that it's, and it's um, don't tweet that anybody, by the way. <laughs> uh, um, you know, you're from this little country, and all the action's happening outside. What, what I've found is that when I go to San Francisco, that living in New Zealand is the prize. We have the best food. You know, so my, my cool, one of my cool weeks will be, I'll make the, um, be, be, be surfing in the Hawke's Bay on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, we'll leave the beach house, um, you know, jump on the plane at five or six o'clock uh, up to Auckland. You see a whole bunch of buddies who are also flying up to San Francisco. It's really just dinner and a movie now. You arrive in San Francisco um, around lunchtime on Sunday. Uh, you go, go and buy a bit of Tex-Mex and uh, buy some Nikes. You usually have your first sort, of, um, first sort of meeting on Sunday night. Then you're just doing meetings right through the week, you know, driving up and down the 101 between uh, Silicon Valley and San Francisco. You know, you're in the car for an hour and a half. Uh, if you're with some important people, they can get you into a really good restaurant. If not, you're sort of queuing outside. When you're in the restaurant, you're queued up like this. The food's not that great. The wine's not that great. Um, and um, uh, it's all just so, so many people and, and all of that. And then, then on sort of Friday, you'll be down um, in Palo Alto. Everyone's sitting on their laptop, you know, Facebook, Twitter, Facebook, Twitter, and uh, talking about business models and all that. And, wow, this is so cool. Then you jump back into, um, uh, jump into the, to, to the lounge in San Francisco, jump back on the plane, get to Auckland, it's closed, gotta wait for Corrie to open, race and get a shower. But then um, uh, finally get down to Hawke's Bay about 20 past eight in the morning, kids pick, a, pick me up, we're at the Hawke's Bay Farmer's Market, having coffee, talking to people. So you're kind of one sleep away from the middle of Silicon Valley, and it, we're so close. And it, and it doesn't matter that we're from New Zealand. If you go into any of these people's office, they have the 10 clocks on the wall, because they've already outsourced their development and supply chain all over the world. They're just in, everyone's international. It doesn't matter that you're from New Zealand. And it doesn't, um, in fact, it's cool that you're from New Zealand because they think we're kind of neat. And, um, <laughs> and, and so our kids are growing up in an environment where New Zealand actually is the prize. It's the best place to live. And uh, we have no constraints because we, with the internet, we can talk to, talk to absolutely anybody. And, uh, and I know that a lot of the kids are already working on Google Docs. We've just changed our whole environment to, from Microsoft environment to Google Apps because you have this collaboration where, you know, if you're writing a press release, it's hot for 10 minutes and we never touch it. So being able to all jump in and collaborate and talking to people, um, you know, um, what Google's done with Hangouts, you can have uh, 14 offices, except for crappy international broadband, that's sort of three work and 14 doesn't work so well. You can just instantly talk to anybody in the world, you know, with GoToMeeting. So our kids are growing up in this environment where they can talk to anybody in the world. They can learn anything from the internet. When I go up to Silicon Valley, and something sort of happened up there, I'm having a discussion about it, because even though they were, um, you know, five kilometers away from it, and I was 12,000 whatever's away from it, um, they went there, but it's all on the internet. So the, uh, we're not disadvantaged being from New Zealand um, anymore, and we tend to think a little bit differently. So there's only four million of us, we're really special, we're really lucky. So I think getting that attitude that you can actually now do big businesses, and for our kids to think globally, that's how we all end up with better schools and hospitals, so our old age is really fun playing Xbox One in the um, retirement home. Yeah. <laughs> or Xbox 32, by then. Yeah. <coughs> I got uh, another two or three questions? Yeah. Uh, Nick? Which, what are the three things you would like to see um, young enterprise students get out of their young enterprise experience to make them great entrepreneurs? Yeah, so, so I think um, there's, a, there's a few things. One is um, uh, understanding that, uh, uh, that business is fun. Um, second thing is that there's, better career, there's other careers in accounting and lawyers that actually we're getting to a point where deep tech is a valid option as well. So now we're seeing a more sophisticated capital markets um, uh, actually doing significant deep tech is, is, is just good. And, um, and I think another thing is that uh, business is about having a diverse range of schools. So that I can live in Hawke's Bay and commute is because we've got other people that actually just want to do nine to five and do that sort of work. So um, <coughs> understanding that the best businesses I've done is when I've got, it's not just me, I've got a collection of founders with a range of schools. So as a team, you're much better. And I think they'll probably pick a lot of that up through the program as well. asking about the possibility of being able to use a student module for Xero, because we do there's certain standards we have to do that involve accounting, mind your own business. Yep. 
Yeah, so um, MYOFB as we call it. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so with MYOB they can just stamp out CDs, it's got no cost. With us we have this massive amount of infrastructure. So um, what we want to do, the vision, we're almost getting there on our third data centre, is hopefully next year we'll start building it. We'd love to have a student version of Xero because we actually have quite a few data centres, so we have some data, some data centres sitting there not being used. They've already spent the money on you know, a few million dollars worth of kit uh, just sitting there. So um, now, and we've, since we've got a bit more gas in the tank now, if we can get the resources, our vision is we could have a student version of Xero where you guys could upload an Excel spreadsheet or something and it creates all of the accounts for all of your students. And then um, we could even simulate by dropping bank transactions in every day uh, so they <coughs> would have the experience of maybe running a business for a year but compressed into a 12 week course. So that's the vision that we have. I know lots of you are using the um, free version of Xero, uh, you know, the trial versions of Xero and just doing that on your own. More than welcome, do that all day. Um, uh, but we'd love to actually have a proper solution where you know, it's free for you guys. I mean, it's great for us, so uh, make it free. The difference is it's just a massive investment to do, and, uh, and we're actually more, uh, we're, we're short of the resources to actually do it, but that's quickly changing. So we'll make some progress on that this year, hopefully for 2015. But um, we have most, pri or many primary schools and intermediates are on zero now. And um, if, if you can you know, tell your people to get on it, there's no reason a school shouldn't be on zero. Uh, let's get that going, and that gives us um, more customers, and that makes it easier to invest. See what I did there? <laughs> yeah. So the, the so the, the so what so what is the cloud? The cloud is is, is um, so so normal computing. You buy a CD, you buy a server, you spend all that money, you put it on. If it breaks, you've got to get someone there to fix it and all that sort of stuff. That's the old model of computing. What the cloud does is say that actually we, we, we build those same applications, but we put them in one data center in, in, in the internet, and then anyone just needs to log on through their browser and they get access to that. What the fundamental thing it does is it changes the cost of distribution. So uh, none of the really big financial uh, companies, Oracle, SAP, sell software to small business because you can't have 150 grand a year salesperson going into account to get a thousand bucks. So the brains of software have not focused on, on that model where you've got to go and install software. The cloud makes it compelling. You know, we can invest, we've invested over 200 million in an application now because anyone can just jump onto it. So what it's seeing is this massive investment, not just in business software, but in education tools. Everything basically is starting to uh, pile into the cloud and just so much investment going on. You know, the education tools that are available uh, this time last year, there's probably 10 times them this year. And that's the challenge, is how do you actually discover all of those things? So, um, so the cloud is compelling, there's no doubt about it. Um, and probably, but the challenge is discovering all of the assets. So one of the things you guys may already be doing as a group, but should do, is get a nice forum going so you can share your experiences. You can just use LinkedIn for free, or maybe some stuff in the education um, already. But I'll create a little forum, you know, one for iPad apps, because there's new ones every day. So if you can find them and, and share each other's knowledge, that'd be cool. And there'll be a whole lot of other sort of education um, uh, products and services which are out there. But, but there will be 10 times as many this year as there was last year. And next year there'll be 10 times as more because there's so much investment piling in. Just one of, a part of one of you know, our jobs are to, um, are to assist uh, young people moving into the workforce. So I'm interested to know from your perspective, what's, what's, what's the ideal profile of a person joining your organisation? Um, yeah, so, so we want, um, uh, so, so again it's diverse, so it's a whole lot, you know, the, the, the kind of nerdy little geeks, shit, we'll take all of those. Uh, but they're too scared to talk to us, so encouraging them to actually go and talk to businesses. Most businesses will have a website with an uh, on, on, entry point uh, for graduates. Um, you know, they should all go to university, because they're so young at 18, so just going in there even, you know, you can argue whether university is good or not, but they should do it, because it's, you know, everyone else is doing it. So I think encouraging them into university is keen, but again, a little bit of technology and systems thinking, and then whatever they're passionate about. Microsoft used to hire um, musicians. Uh, musicians make great coders. Um, what's happened in New Zealand now with companies like us is that marketing is now, uh, is now a real career option. There wasn't a lot of marketing done 
in, uh, in New Zealand, certainly not international marketing, because we weren't building a lot of uh, international products and services. But now, you know, we can't really find marketers, and you know, that's a whole uh, sort of range range of people. Um, and I absolutely discourage them from um, uh, accounting and law. Um, you know, some people should do accounting because we need that, and that is becoming more business management. But shit, we don't need any more lawyers. And and um, you know, quite a lot of those sort of you know, A type A's want to go and do lawyer. Entrepreneurs pay lawyers to do the shit work. You know, just uh, just. You know, like, like we get these you know, really A-grade people who want to go and be lawyers. Why? You know, actually build something, you know, deep tech, and that's, that, 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 that is really exciting. So getting them uh, exposed to other jobs, I and mean, then we have lots of school groups coming through, you know, um, just flick us an email if you guys want to bring a school group through to coming down to Wellington, come and see us. We'll do one of those every day. We'd love to do it. And, and it's part of our responsibility to just educate that there are these new types of jobs. And most businesses will do that. Just, just, just phone them up and you know do a class visit. Good fun. Anyway, that's me. Thank you.